Mr. and Mrs. Drysdale are almost here. Time to get the fancy eating table set. I love these cup holders. Miss Jane really likes her beer, and so they're so handy. Paul, Paul, I don't think you've made these meat skewers sharp enough. You're gonna have to whittle them down a little bit more. I can't even poke this into Granny's delicious juicy possum that she made. Oh, and Jethro, get away from there. Texas tea ain't for drinking. that pretty music again. That pretty music always starts sometime and it sounds so pretty and then whenever I go looking for it somebody somebody always comes to the door. This time I really I'm gonna figure out where it's coming from. I gotta figure out where it's coming from. <gasps> oh no the Drysdales are here. All right I'll have to do that another time. Time to start the show. Welcome everybody to the 38th episode, can't believe it's been 38 episodes, of Living Figuratively with your host, Judy Takis, or Ellie Mae today. Um, tonight, tonight's episode is called The Wreck, This Room is a Wreck. A Wreck Room, that is, or a Rumpus Room is what they used to call it in the 1960s, I guess. I don't know if I ever called it that. Um, it's in our basement, in our walkout basement, right next to our guest room, which you guys saw bunch of episodes ago and uh, for our rec room one of the things we decided to do was this lovely um, southwestern quasi southwestern sort of a theme and the whole thing started with these corbels right here I'm a big fan of corbels corbels are architectural pieces that are used to hold up roofs they actually perform a function in uh, in building a house especially in, you know, days of yore and everything. And these Southwestern corbels we found in Santa Fe, actually, a long, long time ago. And I just fell in love with them. And I thought, you know what? I, these are gonna have a place in my life. I don't know when, I don't know where, or don't know how, but they're gonna have a place in my life. And so we bought them and we brought them home on the plane, which back in the day, you know, it was probably, we probably went way over the weight limit, but you know, I wrapped my clothes around them and everything like that, stuck them in our luggage. And back then there weren't very many flight rules. So we were able to just bring them home. Um, and as luck would have it, many years later when we were building our house, I was thinking, okay, these corbels will be in the basement in the rec room with one of these big old rustic beams that was another thing that I always thought you know I'm gonna have one of these beam fireplaces in my house like I've seen enough of them in ski lodges and places that I just really like being so I thought I gotta have one in my house um, I found this rustic beam at a place right here in Ohio it's called Woodstock from the past where it's this you know quarter mile long building where the proprietor of this place goes and takes down old barns and takes the wood and you know he pays them for pays for the wood I guess or pays the people or the people pay pay him to take take everything away um, but the whole barn is filled with these old kind of corbels or these old kind of beams and you just go and you pick out the one that works perfectly for you and I believe we didn't even have to cut this piece. It was exactly the, it was the size and we built the fireplace to be this size and accommodate this beautiful beam. So we did the stone going all the way up because I love the look of a, you know, the stone, stone fireplace. And because I'm always switching paintings out and because it's really hard to put in the masonry, you know, the masonry nails and then switch those around to hang paintings, I always just have paintings leaning on here. The painting that I have up here right now is by Shirley Campbell. Shirley Alley Campbell, I met her years ago, maybe, but not that long ago, maybe about five years ago, when I curated the Majority Rising show for the Artists Archives, and she was one of the artists that I curated into the show. Now, Shirley is kind of a miracle. She just passed away just maybe two years ago, she was 90 or almost 90 when I met her and she's one of my art idols because 
She paints on the fabulous fringes of the figurative slash portrait world. She paints, she, in her, you know, 70 years of working, she worked a lot during the, the sort of the dark ages of figurative art blight, um, which was most of the last century. And she paint, she painted people from all, all walks of life. She's just this friendly, warm person that can just make friends with anybody. And so like, you know, she painted the motorcycle, motorcycle riders, most of the motorcycle people. She painted from the, um, the gay community. She painted transvestites. She painted burlesque dancers. She painted um, nudes with all kinds of crazy narratives to them. And, uh, and so I really just respect and love her work. And if you pay attention, to, you know, keep watching Living Figuratively, you'll see more of her, more of her work because I have a couple other of her pieces. Um, this piece right here is, it's kind of a drawing and it's also a painting where there's this charcoal drawing with this massive solid figure. And I love the horizontal sort of distance uh, lines in the background, which really kind of go with the whole fireplace and the yellow aspect of it also goes with the colors down here because I've got sort of the bright Southwestern colors. Um, the paint on the wall down here is a Benjamin Moore color called nacho cheese that I've liked for 20 years. We had it in our old kitchen. We put it into this one. It's just a nice, bright, bright, fun yellow. Um, so Shirley, when I got to know her, uh, as part of curating her into the um, Majority Rising show, um, I painted her portrait, which is right down here. This, the actual, the original of this portrait is at the, um, is in the permanent collection of the Artist Archives, but the, uh, this Gicle is actually available and I can print them at different sizes. And so when Shirley posed for me, it was really cool. I had her holding her paintbrush kind of like a cigarette and she asked if she could paint me so in return she painted me which this was the first last and maybe only time that I've ever posed for a um, for somebody to paint me from life and uh, it, it was it was way harder than I than I even expected she wanted to paint it she wanted me to act as if I was painting. So like I wasn't actually painting, but I brought some paint brushes and I held them between my fingers the way that I normally do when I paint. So I thought, you know, okay, I can hold that, that's easy. After about five minutes, it got really, really uncomfortable and my, you know, fingers started getting twitchy and stuff like that. But, you know, I stuck by it and she didn't make me pose for too, too long. She did a lot of sketches and drawings and then she did the painting from the sketches and drawings. She paints from life exclusively, and she, you know, being from the generation which I'm just on the tail end of, where photography was just really difficult to, to use for painting. It existed, but it was very problematic. Um, she just paints from life, and that's, that's how she does it. And she, you know, she does these immersion projects, like where, you know, she did a whole series of motorcycle riders as a commission and the person commissioning, it flew her all over the place to, you know, get this motorcycle rider that has this particular motorcycle and, um, you know, and stuff like that. So like she does all this immersion stuff. And even when she was older, which is when I met her and she was living in an assisted living facility, she, I got the feeling she felt like this was an immersion project. Like she wasn't really one of the old people. She was just there to, paint them and live among them and you know find out who was whatever who who would pose for her basically because she did paint the people so that her her sort of entity and the way that way that she was was why i called my portrait of shirley when i grow up i want to be shirley campbell um because really she just you know her whole spirit and her whole whatever it really really inspires me on her wikipedia page they call her the um Cleveland Zone combination of Lucian Freud and Alice Neal. And, you know, I think that that totally, totally fits. So that leads me to my sort of quasi immersion project that I did where I painted the seniors, senior citizens at my hometown in my hometown senior center. So um, you can see how I pinned on my uh, pigtails. Um, 
what basically what I did was I went to our hometown senior center every Thursday from 10 to 12 and a different senior citizen would pose for me. I had prearranged it. I had sign-ups and everything, and I paid them to model for me. And I would start a painting of each senior, and they would sit there and they would tell me their stories, or they would be quiet and pose, you know, like do their job. Sometimes I would ask them for to make expressions because I was practicing expressions back then. So it just kind of, you know, I kind of had to judge like how the person was going to respond and how, you know, how it was going to go. Um, one of the lovely people that posed for me was Laura and I painted, I called this portrait cameo appearance because she just had this beautiful stately profile and she had this distinguished demeanor. She posed very, you know, quietly and, and did just a gorgeous, gorgeous job. It was only later that I found out what a hotshot she actually really was. She had been a professor of nursing at Case Western Reserve University and had just won this very major lifetime achievement award from them. So, you know, and she was very humble about that, didn't say anything about it, but I found that out later through other, other means. Um, so, and th this was also kind of where I started doing these bright, colorful backgrounds. So she was one of the seniors that posed. Another one of the seniors that posed is this one right here, which I called, I call this painting Chuck Shrugged. And um, he was not naked, he had his shirt on when he was posing, but he had a polo shirt on. And I am, I think a polo shirt is probably my least favorite piece of clothing because the collar just looks like, ooh, you know. So I don't like painting the polo shirts. So afterwards, when I, you know, because I started the portrait, you know, had put two hours in on it, started the portrait, but once I take it away, and work on it like I might work on it for another 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 sometimes hours, depending on how complex it is. Um, I made him shirtless because I thought that I just kind of imagined that that might be what he what he looks like. The uh, name of the, the painting, Chuck Shrugged, came from the fact that when we were talking, because we chatted during the during the posing session, we were talking about Ayn Rand's book Atlas Shrugged. And it's kind of funny because um, Atlas Shrugged, that's a book, and at Ayn Rand herself is somebody that I have very mixed feelings about. Number one, back when I very first read Atlas Shrugged, I totally clicked with the book because I was, at the time, working in a very thankless job with a company that did not appreciate me, and I was super underpaid, and I was working really, really hard. So I really identified with Dagny, who is the main character. Um, and, but the, the whole thing with, with Atlas Shrugged and Ayn Rand that bothers me is that a lot of people whose political viewpoints I very much disagree with have adopted her as their hero. And it's just interesting that this is something that we can agree on and maybe it's different aspects of her philosophies that we like. So I'd like to get into a good discussion with people about Ayn Rand people that have actually read her books, because a lot of people know everything about her without having read her books, and to me that, you know, re read her books and then, then we'll talk. I, I would like to get into a discussion like that. Um, but anyway, so we talked about that, which is why the painting is called Chuck Shrugged, and I actually put together a uh, book about the whole, you know, the, the whole Age of Adventure project um, I think I've showed you this book before in the past, but Chuck is on the cover of the book, and this book is also available on my website for holiday giving. I'm not sure if it'll get to you before the holidays, but maybe it will. Um, in the same the same sessions, there was another another gentleman that posed for me, and he this one is called the Halloween treat or Halloween surprise. I think I can't remember. We he posed on Halloween day, and um, he said he was all happy and he said, I have a little treat for you. And so he opened his mouth and showed me that one of his teeth was missing. It was going to be replaced. But at that particular moment in time, when he was in the hot seat getting, you know, posing for the portrait, the tooth was, the tooth was gone. And so, you know, we had a laugh about it and he had a, he had a great time posing and he let me paint his fun, you know, jack-o'-lantern, jack-o'-lantern look, which was really, really fun. Um, so we'll finish up tonight's episode with this last painting over here, which is an oldie but a goodie. In fact, it's so old, 
I don't even, I didn't even date it. It was like before the time when I dated paintings. Uh, but it was probably from like 1988 or something like that. This painting came from a time when I was living in Massachusetts and I was taking a Monday night, a regular Monday night portrait and figure painting class with Berta Golani, who is a Massachusetts artist. Um, her art sensibilities and my art sensibilities were very, very different at the time. She was all about color. I was all about value and drawing and draftsmanship. So whenever she would come around and give me tips or whatever, um, which sometimes she did and sometimes she just ignored me and just let me do what I do, um, it was always like add color, make up color, you know, put, do crazy, like be more wild with color. And if the color happened to model the form, then, you know, it was all good. But if it didn't, then that was, that was good too. Like it, it wasn't um, with the, her advice wasn't with the concept of the color being, um, creating naturalism. It was creating emotion and passion. So that's why we've got all this abstract, you know, it's like this is a figure within an abstract composition. And, you know, I echoed some of the lines. So this uh, is kind of maybe the closest thing I've ever done to an abstract piece. Um, and maybe, you know, moving forward, maybe I will do some things like, like this more. Maybe I won't. You know, sometimes with the, the patching together of colors, like, for instance, this foot, I think was fairly successful with the patching together of the, of the different colors. And this green on the leg here, um, there's, there's something that I just never would do now, but I don't think it's bad. You know, it kind of has like a little parallel with this, so it, you know, kind of made this little abstract thing. And um, which also kind of brings me to one of my art collecting philosophies. Like, for instance, in this painting, there's a lot of sort of big, passionate, confident brush, brush strokes. Some of them are from ignorance and some of them are from knowledge. Uh, like where, you know, I might know that the foot, you know, needs to be this way. And so I knew that the, the ankle needed to have that there, you know. And other, other parts of it, I'm going to admit, are from sort of ignorance. Like, okay, I'm going to draw some some different colors in the background and I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing. Um, which brings me to my art collecting philosophy where I don't, I don't collect art that is just passion and boldness. And I don't collect art that is just skill and precision. I collect when I collect the passion of a skilled artist. So that's, that's kind of my, you know, I want to collect those wonderful moments when a skilled artist uses their confident, you know, crazy brush strokes that actually come together and work. And that's, for me, has always been the, my favorite, favorite thing about, about painting is when it's paint, looks like paint, but it's reality, but it's paint, but it's also reality. So that's my, you know, art collecting philosophy. Anyway, thank you for joining me tonight for Living Figuratively. Next week is going to be Christmas Eve, so it's going to be the Christmas special. And unlike the real networks where they're going to show reruns and the, you know, the old whatever Christmas special that, that they've played every year for the past 40 years, I'm going to do a new one. It's going to be original. It's going to be live. And it's going to be spectacular. So... Be sure to come back next week, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Christmas Eve, if you're not doing something else. If you're doing something else, obviously, you can watch it later. You can watch it on Christmas Day or whenever you feel like it uh, because it's always, everything always lives on my YouTube channel forever afterwards. So, and that YouTube channel is Judy Takas. So, you can always watch that. But join me next week for the, uh, for the Christmas special. And thank you for joining me tonight. Um, today, for the first time in the 38-week history of Living Figuratively, I'm going to finish with the 1960s TV show reference that I started with. And I'm going to say, y'all come back now, you hear?